Production of Swansong is supported by viewers like you. Thank you. Digimon Adventure Anno Tamer is the next Wonderswan Digimon game, developed by Sims and published by Bandai. It was released on December 16, 1999, but that's not the only game we'll be talking about today. It has a partner game, or as the Japanese would say, an Irochi Gaiban, which translates to differently colored version, in Digimon Adventure Cathode Tamer. Cathode Tamer wouldn't hit store shelves until a month later, on January 20, 2000. Keen observers will notice that both of these games are still way in advance of the Wonderswan Colors release, so why is the footage you're watching in color? And most importantly, why isn't it in English? Well, the most fascinating tidbit about this game is its secret third version, which was only released in Hong Kong and Korea. That's right, the footage you're watching right now is Digimon Adventure Anno Tamer and Cathode Tamer Vidramon version, released on September 18th, 2001, way after the Wonderswan Colors release. It not only merges both games into a single version and gives the whole game a color treatment, but it has a full official English translation as well. As far as I can tell, this is one of two Wonderswan games to ship in the Asian market, with the other being Digimon Battle Spirit. For more about the birth of the Digimon franchise, check out episode 9 of Swan Song about Digital Monster vs Wonderswan. As I mentioned on that episode, the first season of the Digimon anime started airing on Fuji TV the week the Wonderswan shipped in March of 1999. Their first attempt to capitalize on Digimon on the Wonderswan was to ship a glorified compilation of Digimon Virtual Pet Toys released at the system's launch window. In that respect, Anno Tamer and Cathode Tamer are radically different. They're story-driven monster collection RPGs, with the battle system resembling the Super Robot Wars-inspired tactical RPG games that the Wonderswan is famous for. These two games would kick off the Akia Mario vs. Millennium Mon story arc, which spanned five Wonderswan Digimon games released from 1999 to 2001. This story arc would bridge the stories of the first three seasons of the Digimon anime, and the popularity of Akia Mario as the protagonist of these games would lead to him being promoted to main character in Digimon Tamers, the third season of the anime. Ryo's notoriety and reputation as the legendary tamer made a lot more sense if you were a Japanese kid watching Digimon Tamers back in the day than it was if you were watching it like me on Fox Kids because there were multiple games worth of backstory that we were simply missing out on. At a high level, the story to Anno Tamer and Cathone Tamer revolves around the creation of Millennium Mon. Through the mysterious DNA digivolution of Chimeramon and Machindramon, Millennium Mon was born, and nobody could defeat him. Millennium Mon locks up the defeated Digi Destined, which are known in this game as the Chosen Children, and revives a bunch of boss monsters from Season 1 of the anime to act as their cell wardens. Agumon, Tai's partner Digimon, escapes to find help, and Akia Mario steps up to the plate to rescue the Digi Destined and defeat Millennium Mon once and for all. I was pleasantly surprised with Anode and Cathode Tamer's gameplay loop. Each dungeon in the game consists of multiple floors, each of which is a tactics RPG style map on which you must defeat all of the enemy monsters. Health is not restored between floors, meaning you'll have to bring health recovering items, use variable moves, or keep your weaker Digimon out of danger if you want them to survive to the very end. Variable moves are effectively the magic system in this game, which allows for ranged attacks, debuffing enemies with status effects, or healing your own Digimon. The in-game explanation for variable moves makes them sound a bit like light bulb moments in Soccer Frontier. The two ways your Digimon can learn variable moves are by either thinking, which means fighting alongside other Digimon with common attributes, or learning, meaning being on the receiving end of a variable move multiple times. As variable moves are technically Digivolutions, 73 of the Digimon on these games' rosters are only accessible as variable move animations. This also feels like a nod to the series' history in Virtual Pets, as it tries to capture that same unpredictability and mystery that you'd get from having your Virtual Pet evolve over time. Menuing and animations in this game is quick and responsive, which is definitely not something you can say about all games in this style on the Wonderswan. Battle animations look gorgeous, especially in color on the Vidramon version. That's great because you're going to be seeing them often, especially in the early game when you have no variable moves. In fact, the early game is pretty much the biggest issue I have with this game. Basic attacks in this game deal very little damage and take too many hits to kill. 
You've got this wide open map, and once your Digimon meet up in the middle, the rest of the map goes to waste and we just spam attacks until one of us falls dead. It isn't the most compelling gameplay. So how did these three versions differ? Well surprisingly, not by much. The 186 Digimon in the combined roster are split across both games a la Pokemon, requiring you to trade across both games to acquire them all. The game contains three types of Digimon, land, ocean, and sky, which determines how much they can move on different types of terrain. Anode Tamer skews its roster more heavily towards Sky Digimon, whereas Cathode Tamer skews more towards Ocean Digimon. The first Digimon you're rewarded with also varies based on the version. Anode Tamer gives you a Koromon, Cathode Tamer gives you a Tyranomon, and Vidramon version gives you a fitting Vidramon. Actually, let's talk about that Vidramon for a second. Vidramon was originally obtainable for Anode and Cathode Tamer via in-person events, much like Mew was for the Generation 1 Pokémon games. Vidramon's stats haven't been nerfed in any way, so you simply get awarded a broken legendary with the highest HP in the game and really good all-around stats for completing the first dungeon in the game. So while that Vidramon version is arguably the definitive edition of this game, it throws a lot of the original game's difficulty curve and balancing work out of the window. Is the mid-boss you face in Millennium Mon's lair? Anno Tamer features Chimeramon, and Cathode Tamer features Machindramon, both of the component Digimon that came together to form Millennium Mon in the first place. I was also left curious as to why Cathode Tamer launched about a month later than Anno Tamer. Part of me considered that maybe Cathode Tamer contained Digimon that had yet to make their televised debut, that they would want to hold those back. Unfortunately, this also seems to apply to Digimon featured in Anno Tamer, so that doesn't seem to be the reason why. Maybe releasing them a month apart would make it seem like the differences between them would be more substantial than the difference between Pokemon games at the time, but this definitely isn't the case. I must confess that I'm a lapsed Digimon fan. I haven't thought about Digimon in any serious capacity in about 20 years. It's absolutely shocking to me that the Wonderswan, which has such a reputation for being a graveyard of forgotten anime licensed games, had such a profound impact on a franchise I adored as a child. I had no idea. I loved Digimon Tamers at the time, and Ryo was right there staring me in the face. Ken was my favorite character in Season 2, and the next game in the story arc is all about his backstory. When I started this series, I saw how many Digimon games were in the list of games released on Wonderswan, and I was deeply worried that they were all going to be bad and make me think less of the series. But I wound up being so charmed by Anode and Cathode Tamer despite their flaws, that now I'm looking forward to the next one. And I hope you do too.